don't know, what, what kind of like has driven you to what you've done, if that makes sense. Like you went to law school and now you're in tech, like where and when kind of did you make that decision and what kind of drove you there? Um, I'm probably, you know, I'm, I'd say I'm definitely like a unique entrepreneur in that uh, coming from a philosophy background. My government double major was really political philosophy, so like Straussian type thinking under Father James Shaw, who was a guy out of Georgetown. And actually when I was at Ave Maria, I, I completely focused on theology and literature because that's what they were good at. <laughs> they had like Joseph Pierce, they had like a bunch of people, so I was able to study literature under these guys. And their theology was on point. They had like uh, Rigardin, who was really good at Aquinas, stuff like that. And then when I came over to Georgetown, I totally pivoted. It went into, because Georgetown's theology is a joke, you know, it's like ridiculously bad. It's just stupid. It's not like any thinking going on. Um, and then their literature is also like a joke as well. It's not serious. So, but their philosophy is actually world class. So people don't realize that. But they had like, at the time, they, have, they had two people on the Pope's council, like, like one on the President's Council, something like that. It was like this guy Ambrosio is a Aquinas scholar. They had another guy, Keown, who was the Bioethics Council for the Pope. He was Oxford, PhD. They had another guy, Most Murphy, who was studying under McIntyre. I went there because I thought maybe I'd get into public service, so I transferred, you know, like politics or something. But then I was like, after a couple weeks, I was like, hell no. It's just like, not going to work. Um, not interested in it. But I learned the DC game a little bit, how it all works. That wasn't bad. I'll give you a little backdrop, which kind of answers like, why I did a lot of stuff I did. And some of it was actually very strategic. Some of it was opportunistic. So I would encourage you guys to put together a long-term plan. Like a lot of you guys are really young. You know, all of you are very young, right? On actuarial tables, like from what insurance companies use, and they, ought to, they know how to make money, so they're not going to lose money on their bets. Like, all oh, you're going to live to like 85, 90 or something. So you might as well plan around what you know will come, right? So I have current, I have a 60-year plan I put together in 2014. And I, I've worked against that. But even before that, I got, came out of college in 2005. So when I got out of college, I also thought long term. I spent a couple of weeks in silence at a monastery, a Marionite monastery, reflecting, you know, what am I going to do with my life, you know? So really trying to think about what you're going to do before you start just doing stuff, right? So that's, I would encourage that. So, um, so a lot of the, my pathway that I go on, and I do this in business too, is not, it's not a linear approach where you just go like sequentially, oh, I'm going to go do A, B, C, D, F, G, it's going to equal Z, right? So people look at what I'm doing and they're always like super confused, like what the hell are you doing? Like why are you going to law school? You know, why do you get a CPA and yet you're running a business the whole time? Like I didn't go to class at law school, I just like ghosted it, you know? I did take all the exams, passed them, I took two bars and passed them and stuff, so I did, did get work done and stuff, so I understand law, you know, whatever, somewhat. But um, anyways, but so like, but why did I do that? Well, I had a long-term idea of like setting up a foundation. My, when I was in college, I, my foundation was to try to learn how to think and to learn a lot of stuff that later on you can't learn when you're under the gun of pressure, right? You got too much stuff going on. And I didn't know where I'd end up being. Like at first I went to the seminary when I was like 17 or 18, but that didn't work out because <laughs> of obedience reasons. It's just too hard to follow. I mean, that was the hardest I ever tried to follow rules, but it didn't work. But, um, Anyways, and then... Um, he was also kicked out of Montessori school. <laughs> which is for kids who can't obey. Yeah. <laughs> so, I think that's a record. So. Yeah, and I was like, kicked out of my high school, too. So, and, um, but yeah, I've always had problems with authority. It's not, you know, really, but in my head, I was always like, the authority's always off, you know? But anyways, but looking back, it's, my personality's better for entrepreneurship. It doesn't fit well within structure as much as other people, you know? So, but God creates everybody differently, right? So you got to just figure out who you are and then play to your strengths. And... Um, by the way, Christian's a great example. He's one of your own, right? And he's a world-class elite media. And I don't make that, I don't talk crap. You know, he is. He's, I mean, he'd be the best. And he's of the best of the top percentage in Hollywood, which is where the best media is. So that's a good example to look up to right here. And he's one of, he comes from the same background as you guys. You can rise up when you get out there to the top. There's no reason why you can't. I mean, you got to fight harder because you will be soft discriminated against because you're, you know, about Catholic or whatever you might be. You will face that 100%, no, no doubt about it. There was, um, when I was at the law school, was, I, I was just like, you know, curious. I'll just go to like a couple of interviews at law firms. I knew I wasn't going to go that path, but just see what they're about. And a friend of mine was already at this firm, and he said behind closed doors, they were like, man, we're not supposed to do this, but I just want to decide as partners, like, we're not considering this guy Pete for the following reasons, like immediately. Because I had worked with like Mother, I'd started a group called Mother Teresa's Hoyas, I'm very pro-life. Um, 
stuff like that. And immediately just behind closed doors. And he told me afterwards, he's like, and he, he gained a lot of respect for me actually because of it. So you will gain respect behind closed doors too, but they will discriminate against you. And this is a leading law firm in the world. <laughs> this is like one of the best. This is partners just being like, all right, Whisper Network, let's block this dude. I mean, I wasn't gonna work there anyway, so it didn't matter. But then again, though, I also ended up arguing with the dude during the interview, so. <laughs> he was like, he was like immediately trying to like badger me about my positions, and I was like, yeah, you got a yarmulke on, right? The hell are you arguing me about? We should be in total agreement. Why are you wearing a yarmulke? You're like a hypocrite. <laughs> so that doesn't help. But <laughs> anyways, the, uh, <laughs> but we, <laughs> the, uh, but anyways, you're also badgering a guy over like, you know, his pro-life positions in an interview, you know, so. Um, but that's the type of stuff you'll face. Hollywood's extremely, you know, I would say pr pretty far anti, anti-faith people and stuff like that. So you will face the stuff, but just be the best, you know, be the best at whatever you do. Just come at it really hard, outwork everybody, outwit them, stuff like that. But anyways, so college, I would recommend, I still would probably, and that was my mentality at the time, is to try to learn as much as you can. Like you can see, my, like I have a broad learning actually for a business leader. If you talk to the CEOs, it's like really boring conversations usually. But like, I'm not saying it's interesting to talk to me. It wouldn't be if you talk about sports and stuff. I don't know anything, straight up. If you talked about anything pop culture, I don't know what the hell's going on. But you wanna talk about like that thing in India, like I know probably a lot about that. I know anything, but I know a lot about a lot of countries. Like I have a broad learning. You know, philosophy, I do understand it. Not the level of this guy. He just smoked me, <laughs> absolutely. The, uh, <laughs> But you know, so but you know, what I think Aristotle pointed out. I won't quote Aristotle around Aristotelians, but <laughs> that's not going to work well. Uh, anyways, uh, I think he pointed out as you learn certain things, uh, you then have you generate a better ability to learn other things by analogy. You kind of like see this, and you get your head around that, and oh, you can see this quicker, you know. So as your mind expands and grabs on different things, you actually can learn faster other things, right? So like I created our technology architecture for one of our products, which is extremely complex architecture. Most kids coming out of like any of those schools will not be able to do that. So, and I did it in like 30 days. So now I'm a pretty intense person though. So on the other hand, it's totally possible. Well, why, am I just absolute genius? No, I'm definitely not. I went to community college is where I started. So obviously not a total genius. So, and, but you know, by learning a lot of things, it probably developed my mind, the ability to grasp abstract concepts quickly, boom, use them and apply them. And, and the platform works and it's an extremely complex platform using machine learning, computer vision, stuff like that. And, like a huge array of technologies. And I know that other people can't do it because I interviewed, I probably interviewed like 100, you know, of the best architecture type minds coming out of tech. So there are guys that can do it. Our head of architecture will kill me in that area, but he's also a complete genius and he's got years on me, you know? So, but um, yeah, anyway, so, you know, JD, I did that, did the CPA because I didn't know anything about accounting. It's not, sometimes they're counterintuitive how I do things, but law degree, I knew like law was never that interesting to me, but by, Going through it, I'd be forced to learn it. Now, law is the software of society. It, it writes the rules of how everything works, right? Whether you want to go in this school or you want to go do a business, you want to do nonprofit, whatever you want to do, law is the software of society. It sets the, sets the rules. Understanding how that work, it works is going to be helpful. Um, did a CPA when I was there, actually. I had no accounting background, so I had to do like, you know, something like almost 40 credits probably on the side through this technique I came up with, which Harvard probably wouldn't have allowed if they found out, obviously. But I did it in like, this I came up with like this technique where I did it in like two months basically through distance learning and stuff and everyone would have had a maximum of six credits so I do like six different distance learning things accredited universities and then once I got it in then I applied to Massachusetts board for a CPA clearance because I had a JD coming up got the clearance then I just back to back the uh, CPA four exams and just boom 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 knocked them out and then got like a bunch of books and knocked out the CFA and then took my took my final exams finished up the semester <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but yeah, so <laughs> I'm definitely on, on the extreme on that side for sure. But, you know, like we said, God creates everybody for different things, right? So it depends what he's creating me for. Right now what I'm working on is creating new tech leadership. That's why I'm here. That can rival and be on par with Silicon Valley. And I want to create something bigger, better, and very different based on principles and virtues and stuff like that. But anyways, we'll get into that another time. But um, let me, so that's the backdrop. That's kind of my thinking why I did, you know, accounting is the language of business. Now, it's not an intuitive language, actually, but it is the language of business. And finance is kind of the language of cash flow and stuff, and like how you do like loans and whatnot. But the language of business is accounting. Uh, if you want proof of this, go look up accounting. Go look up a company, try to figure out what's going on. Well, what are they gonna give you? Cash flow statement, balance sheet, income statement, right? So can you read it? No, you can't, unless you know what you're doing. So it's a language. You gotta figure out how to do it. Um, 
And then these things come in handy. When oil dropped like, eight, like a year ago or so, a year and a half ago, I basically led the company on a quick trade and I'd never done public investing ever. And I just, boom, just got in my basement in Seattle when COVID hit. And then boom, went down, went through everything. Went through like 50, 60 companies, through their financials, made a calculated bet trade and completely crushed it, you know, without really any risk because I bought companies that were bulletproof. So, um, so these things can come in handy. They build a repertoire of capabilities. Um, anyways, that was like, I don't know if you guys remember oil crash when Putin got in dispute with Saudi Arabia and then COVID hit and there was, you know, all this crisis everywhere a few marches, two marches ago. Um, anyways, you know, Bitcoin, I was able to make a play on that due to my background in legal. I understood it very quickly. A couple Thanksgivings ago, a few Thanksgivings ago, I bought it when it crashed. Now that's up like 30X or whatever. So these things can, you know, really work out. And the real estate side, it was helpful. I bought over a couple billion dollars of real estate. We still hold a billion dollars of assets. It was helpful having a legal background because real estate's, it's part, it's, ha you know, it's at least one third legal and it's like one third, you know, understanding debt and finance and accounting, I'd say. The other third maybe entrepreneurship. But legal helps, right? Look at the most successful guys in real estate. They often have a JD, right? Sam Zell, best ever, JD. So, um, anyways, so that's kind of a backdrop. Gives you a little thinking of, you know, why, you know, Prince mentioned missionary. Um, I don't know if I ever mentioned missionary work, but I am a, a missionary mindset. I'm totally all in whatever I do. And I can't get up in the morning unless it's over a mission work. I can't do it for money. This is how I tick, you know? Even in college, they were like, oh, Goldman Sachs, do this meeting. You're just not going to go. I'm like... I just can't go, man. I'm just not going to be able to go. I physically can't go. <laughs> so I can't do something for money. I have to do it for mission. Otherwise, I'm not doing it. And that's, that's it. And, um, and I've had a lot of proof of this where people lost me a lot, offered me a lot of cash to do stuff. But, you know, it wasn't immoral. It just wasn't something along what I wanted to do mission-wise. So I just wouldn't take it. So, um, and that was even early in my career when I was, like, scraping by. Um, you know, but missionary, I have done missionary work before randomly when I was at college. There was a crisis where they needed someone to bring in supplies and like it was during Christmas, it was hope for the children and no one was available. There was some government problems with uh, San Misa, I think in Nicaragua. So I volunteered to take a bunch of suitcases in of uh, medical supplies and so that was some missionary work that I've done a couple weeks in Leon, Nicaragua. But other than that, I haven't really done missionary work. But I started a group called Mission, uh, what it Mother Teresa Hoyas at college. So that, that worked with Missionaries of Charity and that was basically their AIDS hospice. And that ended up being I'm pretty, from what I understand at the time, and it was, I think it was the largest like service group at college, at Georgetown when I started it. When I was at Aubrey, I started Students for Life when I was there, which obviously it's an easy place to start that, so it's not really, any credit goes there. But anyways, but we were pretty successful. We got in a lawsuit with Planned Parenthood within like, you know, six months and won the lawsuit. So that was good. Because um, they were like, you got to move from this. And I was like, eh, legally I don't have to, I don't think so. So even when I was 18, I was still an arrogant prick. Um, <laughs> so... <laughs> At least I have the humility to know that. <laughs> uh, you know, what things to do to start a company? Well, you know, the one thing I had coming out of college is I knew I could read and understand books well. This sounds crazy to people. They're always like, they just can't believe that. They'll be like, wait, that was the only thing you had? That was like the only thing I had. I had a few thousand bucks from construction work. And when I felt called to go into business, like, well, I had to assess my strengths, you know? And I was like, all right, I know I can read complex stuff and get it, right? It's not that I'm the, be the best. There's like, you know, PhDs in here that'll be better than me, but I know that I can do that because Aristotle's metaphysics is way more complex than anything you're gonna read in business. <laughs> so, but anyways, the, um, so I knew I could do that and I figured that's, that's something unique. And so I could basically, so I used the interlibrary loan system and I basically got like 150 books from like, at first I was getting them from one library, but the librarians were getting so pissed. So I started using different <laughs> libraries to get all the books in. And I just pummeled through tons of books, you know, got videos on how to do a lot of stuff, try to figure out entry point strategy. I came through real estate because I can get money against assets and use the loan system, so that's why. Um, and then, but ultimately I felt a bigger vision to serve people through business, and, uh, and that's what I'm still doing. So my motto is serving, serving uh, people in business. It's on my uh, handle on Twitter and on LinkedIn as well. Serving Jesus slash people in business. But I get it, it used to be just serving Jesus in, in business, but my point is that when you serve Jesus, you serve people, that's why I put it back last. But uh, I got that from Mother Teresa's sisters. That's their motto, serving Jesus and the poor. So, yeah, I think it's worth, so you didn't feel called to real estate specifically? No, yeah, no. Um, it was just a means to an end to get into business on a bigger scale. So, tech, I, I, I pivoted into tech. I, I sort of iterated into tech along the way. I came up with some sort of tech-enabled product when I was at Harvard 
ran into a cash crunch, so necessity breeds invention. Got a computer science kid to help me out from the undergrad, who's a who's actually a devout Catholic guy. Um, um, got that off the ground. It worked within a week, so cash flowed very well. Was able to pay off a lot of stuff, <laughs> get cash coming in. How, how do you know it was working? Did anybody? Oh yeah, well it worked so well that like everyone in Boston was like trying to get it shut. Like they they were so mad because competition. They were like, what the hell is this guy doing? And I never left my apartment. I was just set it up and boom, got it going. And they were like so pissed that like they kept trying to get me shut down. So they had like sent all these complaints to, I was using Craigslist as one of the forums. And so Craig Newmark from Craigslist kept calling me being like, hey, whatever you're doing, like, you know, we're getting blown up by complaints. Like, can you just stop it? Whatever it is. So, so which, a prank from Craigslist calls, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I thought it was a prank from someone locally trying to scare me or something to not do it. They're all trying to get meetings with me too, to be like, oh, we should become friends. I'm like, I'm good, man. They want to like find out what I'm doing, right? So I was like, you guys just got to work harder, man. <laughs> so that's what I told them. <laughs> but yeah, that's why I say you got to outwit and outwork, right? You got to think creatively. How, how do you, can you do something smarter and better, you know? But, um, but yeah, it was Craig because I checked it on like YouTube playing against his voice and I was like, oh, that actually is him. Uh, just confirm we're doing the right thing. Keep doing it. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, so anyways, that's a, the, so real estate, you know, I forget your question, but you mentioned real estate, right? Did you mention real estate? You're thinking about real estate? Uh, yeah, I'm thinking about real estate. Before. You asked me something about entry point strategy or how to get yeah, in? Yeah, more of how, how did you create your company and how do you see it growing with a society that's not always accepting of what you're doing? Like, oh, moralistic, that's yeah. right. Yeah, so we're, you know, we're really open about our views. Um, I've become more and more so as I realize that it's actually better. It's a deterrent to people who are anti-Christian, really bigoted and stuff, because there's a lot of bigots. And they're usually the ones that are saying that oh, the other side's bigoted, they're actually the bigots. So, for sure, 100%, definitely. Because that is the definition of being a bigot, is when you're narrow-minded, you don't listen to their side. You just try to shut them down, censor them, whatever. They are bigots by definition. And the bigotry in Silicon Valley made, you know, and in Seattle was the reason why we are in Austin. The talent pool there is far better. It's 100x better over there. But so we're fighting uphill out of Austin. But we will succeed because we got heaven on our side, first of all. Second of all, we are going to play smarter and we're going to figure it out. We're going to get other people like that. They got a lot of people inside their companies. They underestimate this, the people that are of goodwill and they don't like it either. Even people on the left don't like this stuff because they know it could be them. You know, especially people who are Jewish and stuff. Like, I mean, everyone's been on the bad end of the stick at some point. Like Irish Catholics were 700 years under the British, right? 400, essentially, they couldn't own property. Their indentured servants are pretty, pretty much slaves, right? That was a tipping point for Benjamin Franklin. When he went to Ireland, he saw the way the Irish Catholics were treated. They couldn't even afford clothing, you know? They just like, basically wearing rags, you know? So, and that, that made him realize, no, we gotta like, cause he was a loyalist and he flipped and he saw that. So, but anyways, um, yeah, so I think like, you know, yeah, so I, I'm, I think that it's gonna be, a, actually it's gonna play to our advantage, this kind of lack of morality that's going on. Um, we're, but what's interesting is they don't have a morality, yet they're extremely self-righteous. So it's, it's a weird mix where they're very self-righteous, so much like the Inquisition. <laughs> like, they run the Inquisition, no trials, though. And like, what the hell is your principles? They can't state them. It's just like, whatever the zeitgeist is, they can't, they just like, oh, that's my thing, you know? I'm like this and that. And it's like, okay, yeah, you can't be trusted. You can't be trusted then, because then once your self-interest is too driven, you will have no principle to tether you back from like doing what you want to do. And you can see this with Facebook, right? They're exploiting teenage girls. Like, what the hell? I got like, nine, I got, my, my family has so many damn kids. I'm sure you guys are Catholic, so you know how it is. But my brother and sister have six and seven each, right? And, and so I have 12 nieces and I have two girls. And these guys can't resist making more money by like preying upon these and exploiting teenage girls to make them feel like self-conscious. Suicide rates go up. They get notified of it and they don't change policy. Like, these guys are just have no morals. They don't have any principles. They really don't, they don't have any principles, but they think they do, but what are their principles? Can they articulate them? That's why I've said before, like Judeo-Christian principles, I don't mean Jewish and Christian, I mean just, those are principles you can point to that have been timeless, right? I've said this in the media before, but then people have been like, oh, that's like Jewish or Christian, you can't say religion. Like, you can anyways, and then, I'm not even, I didn't say religion, it's just once they hear the word Christian, they're like, ah, triggered or something. It's like, <laughs> shut up, man. Um, the other thing is someone needs to take a stance, and it's gotta be like, you know, so who's gonna take a stance? Am I gonna complain about it? Oh, why is nobody taking a stance? So I'll just take a stance. Like no tech leader wanted to come out and be pro-life? Well, I'll just do it then. W what's gonna happen? They're gonna like kill me? Whatever, man, I'm gonna die anyways eventually, but good luck getting me. Well, I don't wanna do what's been done to us. We should, have, we should lead by example, not be hypocrites, right? We have a, a forum, we wanna invite all viewpoints. You know what I'm saying? 
we had this Texas A&M thing before here at law school recently from a guy that went to Harvard Law with me. And um, he's a professor there. But so I was doing something in front of his class. So you could see a few people trying to take some, take some shots, you know, near the end when they get open up for questions, which is cool. I don't, I don't care, whatever. I'll just shoot back, you know. But, uh, the, uh, but, but, but I think what they realize is like, hey, man, like, get out of your little, like, you know, anger, hatred zone. You know what I'm saying? Like, like I've got something to say, too. You have, let's just hear it out. And like your actual like gunshot at me is like I'm gonna maybe agree with that. That like, you know, one of the girls is like, what about living wages or something like that's maybe gonna trip me. I'm like, living wages is like basically a Christian concept. So yeah, I totally agree with that. You know, I'm not some like conservative or libertarian necessarily, right? I'm conservative with my morals and faith and stuff like that, our family. But basically, there's a lot of things that people don't realize about Christians and stuff, right? And even if I disagree with living wage, well, let's just maybe I got maybe I'm wrong. You know, maybe she's wrong. Maybe she doesn't understand market economy. You know, whatever. I think it's both market economy, as libertarians would say, but it's also living wage. I think they have good points. And then someone else about vaccine stuff, you know. But whatever. Which I said, well, you know, you want me to impose something on, like, your body? You know? Which is the point they make about pro-choice, which is actually not their body anyway. So, but with the vaccine things, they want to put it on everyone else's body. So I used their own language that replied to her. But I could see that she was won over by the ideas. But you want to have, like, a thing where these ideas are out, right? Because then you can learn from each other. So, anyways, um, well, what kind of tech we're doing, I think, you know, someone asked that. Um, we're doing, I say tech, not just software. We do have, obviously, software as well. Technology companies are controlling our, our public square right now. They, they control it down to the metal. They control where you keep your data, if you're smart, where you keep it. They can, like servers and stuff with AWS, Amazon Web Services, or Azure, which is Microsoft. These are, these are in radicalized areas. And they have used their power in authoritarian ways. They've been trusted with things to deplatform people and do other stuff like that, right? So they're controlling the public square. That is the real public square right now. It's online. And they control your phones, too. You only have two options, Android or, or iPhone, right? Those are both in Silicon Valley. That's Apple and, and uh, Apple and Google controls those, right? But your payment structure is also controlled by Silicon Valley. Visa is out of there, too, and so is Stripe. So you're beholden to them right now. We need to create a new ecosystem. That's what I'm working on. So my ask would be, you guys spread that word. But I, we have social media online. You can hit whatever, spread the word online or tell people you know. But what I, I would like to inspire you guys to get it, be more entrepreneurial. And when we talk about our tech, we do machine learning, which is basically running using data in a certain area that you want to apply correlations to the data. First, you start with simple algorithms. Then you start applying it to certain areas. Then as you do it, it starts to grow on itself. It gets smarter. It can predict things better. You know what I'm saying? So for example, like, you know, if it knows that you go and you get coffee at a certain place, right? This is not what we're doing, but I'm just trying to give you how machine learning works. It knows you get coffee in a certain place. It also knows your demographic is between, say, 27 and 33, and you are, like, American. We know that that, you know, you could figure out, OK, well, that correlates well with you buy a muffin. OK, so you suggest a muffin. That would be machine learning, because you're using a correlation, knowing that by the data we already know independently that this person's buying muffins. We also know you are actually right now buying a coffee. We know coffee shops have muffins. Suggest a muffin. That would be machine learning. I'm just trying to break it down so you understand it. These things are going to dominate soon. They're already moving. It's going to be scary how good the stuff is. It's, it already is really good. We're doing it right now on a number of our technologies, and it's really good. It beats the human. It beats the person. And even the guys that are cocky, they're like, nah, I know what's up. I'll be able to predict this. OK, let's go. Competition. Machine learning thing we just put together versus this guy. Machine learning ones. And that'll be like our best guy. I'm, pre I'm predicting what will happen on, like biz on business stuff that we're doing. We're applying it to technology. Now, blockchain's another technology we're using. We're putting real estate on the blockchain. We're tokenizing assets and allowing people to buy and sell them. That democratizes, a democratizes assets to real estate. So that's another one we're doing. It's called Own Prop. It's not released to the public yet, though, but we're already moving on it. It's already happening. We have a few other ones, data product that we are going to, and this is confidential, but we're working on setting up permissions in a way that you can control your permissions. That way you control what people can get, get or can't get of your data in a decentralized way, and we're going to be leveraging the blockchain for that as well. So I won't get into that one more because that's the secret one right now until we come out with it. The other one's already out. You've got to be careful because everyone will replicate what works. And then we got a fintech product, insure te insurance tech. we got a bunch of them. But uh, what blockchain are you using? Ethereum. Okay. So, but there's, there's different competing chains that could work. But Ethereum's probably the best just because of the ecosystem is more robust right now. But it doesn't mean it'll be there forever, right? And that would be the one that wins. It could be Yahoo to Google, right? Google ended up beating Yahoo. But um, the other one I'm looking at is Solana. We're keeping, it, keeping an eye on it. It's, on, it's moving pretty fast. And 
But we have blockchain guys who specialize in this. I don't specialize in it, but I do understand it a little bit. And obviously enough that I'm been betting on it for a while now. So, and I think it's going to be an answer to a lot of our current problems. I think as you have current problems, you have solutions readily available to people who are, have the courage to stand up and do something. So we can stand up and do something and use these technologies to break up the centralization of power in the hands of people that are becoming, uh, become more and more tyrannical. So, but it doesn't mean people, it will happen, right? You have to do something. God depends on human action. If he didn't, he wouldn't have become man. You know what I'm saying? He had to incarnate because no one else was going to do it. He's the only one that could do it. He counts on us to keep, continue to do it, right? I'm just, it's true, right, what I'm saying? I'm more like theolo theologically or whatever, you know? But I could talk to you guys like that. I can't do that elsewhere because I'd be like, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> so, um, yeah, so then, you know, these are some of the techs we're do the, the tech things that we're doing companies-wise. I've, I've financed a lot, basically everything my, on this stuff, pummeling all, a lot of cash in here into getting these things off the ground. But someone had to do it, and someone's got to push it out. You know, now, now we're relying upon other investors to start coming in behind me uh, soon. So uh, otherwise, we're going to burn, burn out of all of our cash soon. <laughs> so, but we're still in a good spot now. We've got to be careful. It could happen. Texas, moved to Texas for a number of reasons. Huge state. I think it's the next big wave. You know, you could get lucky and land in the wave. You guys are in the wave. You don't realize it, but it's picking up underneath you. But you got to be smart enough to realize you got lucky. You know, so you are lucky to be in the wave. It's starting in Texas. The next big wave's coming out of here, I think. And that's why I moved. One of the reasons why I moved. It's also more open culture. Ironically, because like in Silicon Valley, people be like, oh, Texans, they have this mentality. Oh, Texans are like closed-minded. And it's like, actually, they're open-minded and you're closed-minded. <laughs> but if you're closed-minded, that's exactly how you would think. <laughs> so, but... And there's a lot of good people in Silicon Valley and Seattle, by the way. The issue is they are, they're somewhat repressed. Like they can't speak up as much or they don't feel like they can because they're worried about their career or whatever. And these are valid concerns. You know, you could get basically kind of hurt your career trajectory by doing stuff or whatever. So, um, yeah, startup versus big company, you know, what to go with um, is, you know, it, it's, a, I mean, look, you can learn from different things. You know, I would say, where I would come down is to go, f there's a couple things here, right? You, you want to get a good brand name that, you, you could want to get a good brand name, there's an argument for that. You can get that from like certain companies, right? Goldman Sachs, whatever, whatever, these types of companies. So and there's an argument for that. I've heard that obviously when I was in college. And, um, but then there's an argument for, you know, you have a long trajectory ahead of you. You have, like I said, actuarially probably about 60 years ahead of you, but don't waste your youth because you have to invest it well and it will pay back later. But so don't be like, oh, I've got a lot of time. I'm going to you know, mess around all the time, you know? I mean, have fun, but, you know, apply it yourself. You know, it's a gift at the time. So the law of the gift from John Paul II. The, uh, I know you like John Paul II. So the, um, that means whatever you, get, whatever you have been gifted, you have to give back is the law of the gift. But anyways, the, um, yeah, so I, I would recommend going to startups, like, which also ties into owning a business, right? Because when you go to a startup, you actually own a business. You get equity. And if you think about equity's value, well, it's not that valuable in the next three years for you guys. It's valuable in 10 to 20 years. I mean, it's a crazy value in 10 to 20 years. There's a guy applying to our company right now from DoorDash. He was only three years at DoorDash, and he left when they ran into a cash squeeze, and they, he, thought he, they thought, he thought they were going under, so he left, right? Well, he's got over 20 million bucks from that three years now, because it was you know, 10 years later. You know what I'm saying? It's just, you can make a lot of money off equity, <laughs> even if little slivers, like, he was like, you know, just, whatever there between like 2014 to 16 or something. So, and there's a lot of people that do that in Silicon Valley and that's real money out there. Like this is not fake, you know, it's like, oh, it's all gonna bust or whatever, yeah. And then people realize, no, maybe it will bust, but it don't matter, it's still huge. Even if it busts, it ain't going away. So, and before it busts anyways, I'm, uh, in my mind, Bitcoin is gonna hit, is gonna hit a million. Like, um, that's, I haven't sold my Bitcoin, I'm up 30X, right? Still whatever, hold it. I don't really care. I mean, it's going to go, I think it'll go up another, it's going to go up a million. It's at 60 or 70 right now, right? Um, I might not be wrong. I'm not saying to trade on my ideas. You make your own decisions. But, but I think, like, the other thing is, like, you know, it's much more likely that Microsoft hits 4 trillion than it goes down to 100 billion. It's at a trillion, say, right? Whatever, a couple, of, one to two trillion. And it's also much more likely, like, Amazon gets to 4 trillion than it goes down to 100 billion. So, Anyway, so my point is like there's real economic power there and guess what calls all the shots in America? Uh, economic power. Go to DC. You'll see like this behind the scenes, where's the money coming from? Calls like the initial shot and that sets into the motion. 
now you need good operatives there and stuff like that. And there are a lot of good people we have there that, that do good work. There's also you know, a good slew of people that are you know, not aligned with us. But anyways, um, so that would be my thought on equity is that you don't necessarily have to start your own business, but get equity. Like go long, you ever heard of like go long and go short? Like they say short something, long something, go long on it. The main thing is you go long term on it, or you short means to sell it, you wanna get rid of it fast. I would say you want to short cash, you know, like getting paid, like don't wanna get paid. Instead, take the equity as much as you can get while you're young. And that has been my philosophy. I've never been paid a fee in my life. So I've had that philosophy after I read the books, I realized I was the equity. And I just, I'm also like, kind of like an extremist, so I just like stuck to that discipline, you know? So I would turn people's fees back over to them as like, well, you hooked me up with more deals, you give me this. You know what I'm saying? That's kind of, I've also slept you know, on the floors for, for, for years, ate canned foods for years. So I'm not saying you should do this, but that was how I did things. Um, how to keep an open culture. You know, I, I think lead by openness. The climate is a council culture. I think that requires a culture of courage. To be courageous and st stand out and say things. By me even saying my positions, it almost gives permission to people to also stand up and say their positions and not be scared. Um, you know, the strength of one person, right? One dissenting vote. There's, a, there's like old movie, what the hell is that movie? It's like something about the jury. Yeah. It's kind of a boring movie, but it's considered one of the best ever. And that does, that does show the power of the dissenting vote, voice. You know, so anyways, dissenting voice, I also think it's, it's absolutely key, you know? One person can make a very big difference. And I think keeping that, as a leader doing that, and then also, me trying to make statements publicly even that leftist people are welcome here and we're not going to do what they what radicals have done and i have friends that are leftists and i've even at law school they would be like they wouldn't even identify me as like being conservative they didn't, didn't really they wouldn't think of it and they were actually surprised when i found out i was like even christian which i was like wait <laughs> so why is that <laughs> so no <I'm> kidding. <laughs> the thing is like i think you, know, you want to hear these different opposing views, right? Even here, you guys want to hear all the views. Otherwise, you'd be blindsided when you come out. And also, it's not like these guys are like, even like woke culture, right? Or whatever this woke stuff's going on, right? Is it all bad? No, I mean, some of it's got to be true. There has to be some of that to be true. Or, or the stuff they had when, you know, a lot of the whatever Black Lives Matter stuff, right? Well, there is a lot of discrimination against people of color and stuff like that in this country. It's freaking BS. Like, it's definitely some truth there. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, now is it all true? No, there's also a bunch of nonsense going on. But at the same time, you gotta like, we have to listen to the other side. Try to, like, try to stand in their shoes and understand what the hell they're talking about, because they're, and they, because it could be something there, right? And that also helps in business. A lot of times, like, where someone has a disagreement with me, this happened just recently. There was a guy running one of our businesses. He's up and coming guy. He's probably gonna be CEO shortly of it. Runs one of the tech companies. But he was challenging me on this point of how I'm dealing with the equity structure. And I was like, all right, cool. Like, let's just have it out. Like, you know, what's up? And he's like, well, why don't we do, why, why do you have an option pool when, you know, it dilutes the employees and then whatever. You just kind of get in this argument. But I was like, okay, cool. He has a finance background, very smart guy. He was at Microsoft for many years. Leading guy, real top notch, elite player. And I was like, all right. So I try to like really understand what he's saying. And, and I understood, I didn't even understand that people do it a different way. Like some people set up an option pool separately from the actual total pool of equity and they only give away from the option pool. So they only dilute the ones that are given equity. This is kind of a complex business concept, but it's not that complex, but you might be like, well, what is he talking about? But whatever. There's an option pool. They give away just from this little pool of say 20%, right? So it dilutes just this part of it. But then the other people, the ownership will have this side, the 80%. And I was like, cause I was confused. Why is he, I'm like, I don't understand what he's saying, but then I understood what he said. And I was like, okay, I see. Okay, here's why I don't do this. And then I explained why I don't do that. And the reason why I don't do that is because there's a misalignment I create then between myself on ownership and them. I make it the employees versus the company. I want everyone's an owner in the same pool of the 80%. That means he gets a new guy in the company, he gets diluted. Diluted means he gets less equity in the company because he just gave away some to a new person. That puts him in line with me. Then, I, then we're totally, we're rowing in the same boat. Then I don't gotta be watching over his back. Hey, what are you doing? Why'd you do this? Because I know where he's coming from. And then when he got that, he was like, oh, okay, all right. Cool, all right, I'm in. And I'm like, and look, if you, if you want more equity, just earn it and ask for it. And like, I'm cool with that. And it's not all about like me trying to get more, it's about us get more, you know? But anyways, I think listening to the other side, whatever. Um, 
Startups succeeding against big companies, they always do, they always will. It's because when companies get big, they have the innovator's dilemma happens. This is a really good book. It's called Innovator's Dilemma. There's not that many good business books, by the way. They're usually written really crap, you know, and fluffy. And, and that's why I could read 150 in like a very short time because there's not much in there. But um, anyways, there's a book called Innovator's Dilemma written by a guy, Clayton Christensen, very good book. And another one he calls Innovator's Solution. That's also good for you guys as leading up uh, this university because it will give you an idea of how you can get trapped in your own head. But big companies naturally will get trapped. They, when you get a profit stream coming in, you start to protect that stream. Well, the reality is technology creates new streams of new profits that aren't very profitable at first. They're like, you know, small. So then you never go after those because you need to protect your current streams. So you don't want to deploy resources towards less profitable things. Well, those things get bigger before you know it. And then all of a sudden, they're knocking you out. And that's how it works, right? And naturally, people get protective when they have something. And big companies have a lot. So they start protecting and protecting and bureaucracy and bureaucracy. It slows them down. Startups have more speed then. They can keep coming faster and faster. So that's why startups will always win in the long run, provided the government doesn't regulate the hell out of things. You know what I'm saying? So like re heavily regulated governments don't have much startup action like France or something, you know? So sorry to any French lovers, but <laughs> I only eat American fries. Sorry. Freedom <laughs> fries. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think I've covered most of these anyways. Yeah, I, I got into tech because I wanted to serve people globally anywhere in any nation, and tech enables you to build something in one spot, and you can serve some in Nigeria. You can be selling, like own prop the blockchain for real estate, you can be buying and selling those assets that we put on the blockchain from Nigeria, and you could bank your money there instead of like have currency in Nigeria that's gonna get basically inflated every, you know, every like month or year by the government that's just like prints the hell out of money, which essentially enslaves their own people. And that's not just Nigeria, that's like China, and whatever. Let me not pick too many fights with governments that I'll be doing business with, but. Uh, <laughs> Any other questions right, before we wrap up? Yeah. Yeah, talking about putting real estate on the blockchain sounds super exciting, actually, because over the summer, I was interning at Goldman Sachs and it was asset management real estate. So it seemed like the status quo on how, how that's dealt with and using blockchain. But my question is, like, I study philosophy. I have a business minor, right? Some experience within startups, but could you speak to that transition that of wanting to work maybe more in tech, but not necessarily even knowing how to code? Is it just like an effort thing, pushing through? Different yeah, I mean, if you want to break into tech and philosophy background, I just would leverage your ability to abstractly reason and use that as like, a, you know, your advantage versus people coming out of like Berkeley or Stanford or MIT that have been like rigorously trained in technical thinking because technical training and stuff doesn't train very well in liberal arts type thinking where you can like, well, okay, so that's the way it is. Well, how about if it was a different way? Like, why is that like that? Like, does that need to be that? Like, basically just challenging every concept and, and like flipping it around, thinking it from different ways. There's all sorts of talk tracks in Silicon Valley that I've even fell into a little bit myself and I realized we're wrong. Like, even the way they think about how you get capital, like how do you build companies? There's just like talk tracks they have and they're, they're not really questioned. And like, if you think about it, the way to really beat any pack is to figure out like, you know, here's the pack going this way. Well, how do I get to like there, but like not going the same way? Because when you're in the pack, you're kind of, you know, it's hard to, hard to beat it. You got to figure out how to get around that rat pack, you know? But, but I think philosophy, you can use that to you know, help you get in there and use that ability to reason and stuff and think through things rigorously and also get books, think through that stuff and try to understand it. And then you might find yourself actually understanding it better than the other side does, who's actually technically superior to you. So There's a number of other positions outside of software developer or working product management as an opportunity as well, or if you want to get into the marketing side or the finance side, there's a number of things. like. We oftentimes will hire for talent. We say this person doesn't actually perfectly fit this job description, or maybe we don't even have a job description that fits what this person's skill set is. But we we're going to take a bet on this person. They're smart, developed, they can think. We realize that they're going to get an opportunity to go in a bunch of different directions and a bunch of different places. And if they thrive in any one of those, or they thrive in all of them, they're just going to get more opportunities. That was what I had to do in Hollywood. It was like no one's recruiting from like Warner Brothers here at UB. Right? <laughs> uh, and so I had a background in it, but what happened to me was there was a, a guy who came to present at one of my uh, law classes. He was a producer of a film. And when he got up and finished his presentation and walked out, I followed him out of the place. And within about a week, I was working on the film that he was producing in DC. And that one led to the next one, and that one led to the next one. And I remember sitting there, watching him going, and going like, am I gonna do it? Am I, gonna, I think I might get in trouble, but I'm doing it. <laughs> and I just chased him down. 
And that was that was what started catalyzing everything else. Now I had to like execute at every single level and be the best. And at each point, I was the only Christian working for our company. We won a bunch of Academy Awards, won Best Picture four different times. At one point, the CEO of the company, who used to be head of Universal Pictures, was looking for a Catholic perspective on a film. It's called Spotlight. Uh, and uh, they eventually tracked me down. I wasn't working on the film, they tracked me down. And I went and looked in the, the email chain of like, what, okay, what do they want to know? I, I consulted on a trailer that they changed because of my feedback. And when I went up to the top, uh, the, the CEO, who used to be the head of Universal Pictures said, you know what, I just realized I don't know any Christians. He didn't know a single Christian. He had one of the most powerful positions in Hollywood. I was the only Christian he knew. And before I took that job, my mother, God bless her, said, don't forget, you might be the only Bible these people have ever read. And it actually was true. So it was that always that executing. So they knew I was a Christian guy. They knew I went to daily mass, but they're just like, yeah, it's Christians. It's great. He begged off the project because it was about contraception, but he's really good. We got to keep him, and we really like him. You can always hit that bar. It doesn't matter what your background is. Yeah, there, there's examples in tech also of success where I'm not saying these guys are the best guys or not the best guys. But Steve Jobs, liberal background, was not technical background, and then um, tons of non-technical backgrounds. But then within philosophy, you also have like. Uh, the guy from, um, what the hell is that company, Slack? Stuart Butterfield's philosophy background. So you have a few of these ones. It's definitely not uncommon, and you see a lot of JDs in tech as well. Peter Thiel's philosophy type background. And so you see, like, you know, you actually see less MBAs and business people, actually. That's, that's kind of scarce, I'd say, in Silicon Valley. And, and I haven't really experienced that, like, business people coming out of business school or whatever are that much better, actually. I don't know. The one thing I would say, though, man, this is something it's more like family with you guys, because like we, we, we have a lot of shared ethos, right? So I want to, I could be like, you know, I'm already direct anyways, but I could be very direct. Like, the biggest problem I've seen is softness, like being a wuss. Like, that's, that's a real problem. Come in, you're like, like a kind of wussy. Well, you're not going to come up like that. First of all, you're already a bit disadvantaged anyways. So you're going to come in and be like, oh, I, don't, I can't work that hard. I'm not going to work this many hours or whatever. Like, okay, what the hell are you doing here? Like go somewhere else then. It, it's just like a, there's a disconnect sometimes between the talk of like, yeah, we're Christians, we need to sacrifice, look at Christ, he went all the way, to like what we actually do. We just like complain. Oh, look at this, the world culture, this blah, blah, blah. What the hell are we doing about it? Let's go, we're gonna take this hill? Let's take it then. It's not compl- let's just be about, let's be about doing about it. Or just shut up, don't say nothing. And just be like, I love it the way it is. I like abortion and everything else. And just be like, because we're not going to do anything about it anyway. So, <laughs> you know, but if we're going to say, if we're going to complain, let's just figure out what to do and go after it. But that includes a lot of sacrifice, which means coming home late at night and being like, okay, I'm going to go read for four hours now after I just work 12. I might already be like, oh, this guy's like an extremist. Like, yeah, whatever. Say whatever you want. I'm also very successful. And if you want to be successful, if you want, us to be successful if you want to change these things. We need people making sacrifice. You know what I'm saying? It's been a, a even with my own family, like they've had to get to, to know me and kind of realize like how I am, you know? And I think like we need to be like that. Or we just need to not complain about anything and just be like, oh, we are, you know, complacent, we're gonna be mediocre, we're gonna be lukewarm people. So but anyways, what I want you to be, I'm trying to motivate you, is to be really hard driving, back up that Christian talk. Like, back it up through sacrifice. Like, do what you got to do. Get in there. Be the first one there in the morning. Be the last one there when they leave. You know what I'm saying? Like, I even did that when I was CEO, man. I'd be like, I'll be the first one there, last one to leave. And when I leave, I don't go home to go hang out. I leave and I go work. I'm, like, reading and stuff and trying to build my mind up. All these things add up, though. They give you compounded advantages. And you're not at a disadvantage coming out of UD. And, in fact, if you're well-educated by the likes of, like, you know, your president over here, glorious president, I mean, he's a renowned scholar, a great philosopher, and you're around great minds, right, who are pushing you. Like, you can come out really sharp, and you can actually have an advantage intellectually. You will have other disadvantages, but my point is you can win, but, you know, you have a, a tough, head, you know, tough fight ahead of you and stuff. So. I love that emphasis on, on working hard and making sacrifices. I mean, that's, that, that's the missing key I see oftentimes, and uh, it's not a generational thing. I think it happens in other generations as well, but nothing's going to be handed to it. Right? You're going to have to really work for it. And what you're describing, you know, putting in a 12 hour day, coming home, spending a little time with the family, and then working until your eyes are kind of shut and getting up and doing it again, that's, 
that's what you actually have to do to be really successful. That's just the problem. And the people yeah. you're competing against, I would, I would speak for Hollywood, they do this, they work this hard for money and for power. That's their motivation. And they will outwork you. We should be outworking them for something much, much greater than money and power. Absolutely. If we can find people who will do it for Jesus, but they do it for money, game over. Yeah, and the whole thing of like family dichotomy versus work is just nonsense. Like, I spend more time with my wife and kids than most business leaders do because they're out watching the football game, they're messing around, playing golf or whatever. So you just gotta be disciplined, man. I just prioritize them. Just like first thing in the morning, we wake, we have an hour together, no phones, nothing. We discuss some philosophy actually. We read Benedict, <laughs> my pope. Um, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> I'm teasing, I'm teasing. The, uh, well, he's still, he's still alive, right? My pope emeritus. And uh, <laughs> the, uh, no, but we'll discuss the, you know, we'll go through, he's got this, this thing called the Benedictus, we'll read one of those things, discuss it, and my kid's six, four, two, and, you know, seven months, so they, they don't really have too great of insights yet, but still, it's, it's a chance to dialogue with my wife, at least. They all say something, you know, my, my Isabel was like, two, she says the same thing every time, because God loves us. <laughs> and then if I don't call on her, she's like, gets really upset. Like, there's one time I forgot, my wife's like, hey, you didn't call on Isabel. Like, is like, Isabel, what do you think? She's like, because God loves us. And I was like, nailed it again. The, uh, <laughs> yeah, but I think you got to prioritize, man. It's, it's hard to do, you know, but it's not that hard to do. Just, you know, Ignatius Loyola say first things first, right? And Jesuits, no one accomplished more than them in their heyday. Those guys were killers. So, and they're just first things first, right? First in the morning, I pray. Get my, and then when I work out, do my rosary during my workout. So I get a 30 minutes of silence, get my rosary workout in. Then I do like a HIIT workout. That's it. So within an hour, I'm showered, I'm ready to go. That's it. I do not do any other gym stuff. I don't, don't got time for that stuff since I've been married. And then, but I stay more fit than most CEOs actually, ironically. And they have like fitness trainers and all this other stuff they're doing. So um, anyways, you can do it. It's just, you know, discipline and then cutting out nonsense. Like, you know, you just have to say goodbye to like certain things like pop cultural stuff and sports if you really want to push it out and also be, you know, exceptionally, exceptionally good at something that moves the world forward. You don't really need Netflix. Yeah, you can still watch that. I do a date night once a week with my wife. Yeah, you can watch movies. You can get all that stuff in. And, and when you're single, then you definitely don't have an excuse, especially if you're like, a, you know, you don't even have a kid, you're not married, you know. But, well, thank you for spending time with us. Thank you guys. This Appreciate it. really fantastic. And some real words of wisdom. Yeah, thank you guys. Appreciate it. Thanks.